void runners. Well, here we are again, Thompson said, looking at the digital display on the wall panel. It was 18 hours on, and their shift had just ended. Gregory sighed. I can't remember the last time I stepped on solid ground. Feels like we've been floating in this sardine can for a lifetime. I just want to fill my lungs with real air and splash in some ocean somewhere. If this job wasn't paying so much, I would consider making this my last run. Thompson chuckled, I don't blame you I don't feel much like working our asses off for a pittance either. But it's what we signed up for. I do miss the smell of real oxygen. Not this recycled shit they pump through the vents. Gregory nodded, yeah, and what about the women and the bars? I miss feeling something other than cold steel under my boots. Some sand or something would do the spirit nicely. Couldn't agree more, Thompson said, we're living in a damned bubble here. No sense of night or day, no weather, just the constant hum of the engines and the stale taste of recycled air. I mean how many times can you recycle our piss and evaporated sweat? And the work, don't get me started on the work, Gregory groaned, one minute we're hauling cargo, the next we're mining asteroids. Feels like the captain would take any job as long as it paid. No thought to how it might be on us. I know I complain, but somehow she still wants it together. Thompson shook his head, true as that is. That's just it, isn't it? We're just cogs in the machine. Even the captain, as far as we are concerned. As long as the ship's running, they don't care how we're doing. I feel bad for Patterson, she's been struggling to keep us afloat for a year now. Instead of continuing I heard she's going to retire the vessel soon. That is if business doesn't pick up around here, when is the last time we got a good contract? They both looked up at the digital display. Almost in sync, they rose from their seats, their tired limbs stiff and rigid. They walked briskly down the corridor, the anticipation of a hot meal in the mess hall driving them in a zombified state as they stretched. Turning the corner, they stopped. A line had already formed outside the mess hall, Christ on a cookie. Thompson yelled. Fuck me, Gregory muttered, running a hand through his hair, guess we're not the early birds today. Thompson shrugged, guess not. Just another day in paradise, right? They joined the end of the line, resigning themselves to the wait. Their conversation, though grim, had a comfort in its familiarity. When it was their turn to stand before the almighty nutrition expert and crew proclaimed chief. They smiled, another familiar step in their routine. Her ability to cobble together masterpieces out of scraps of garbage provided to them by whatever employer they were under contract with was enough to cater the halls of gods in their opinion. Ah, Thompson and Gregory, right on time, Pamela greeted them. I hope you're hungry. We've got a special treat for you today. Jonas, you've no idea, it's been a long shift, Thompson said, his eyes twinkling with excitement. After a long boring 18 hours of staring out there in the abyss, a good meal is like a ray of sunshine. Gregory nodded in agreement. Absolutely. You're the highlight of our day, chef. It's what keeps us going out there. Pamela chuckled and leaned against the counter. I'm a nutrition specialist not a chef. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But before you dig in, tell me, besides Long, how did your shift go? Any interesting surveys out there? Any interesting reports? Thompson and Gregory exchanged glances and laughed. Just the usual, Pam. Lots of numbers to examine on our hollows and endless hours of watching the black nothingness pass by, Thompson replied with a smirk. Gregory chimed in, oh, and we had a brief encounter with an asteroid that decided to get a bit too friendly. Gave us a good scare, but we managed to maneuver around it. Pamela shook her head, her eyes filled with mock concern. 
You two always find a way to keep things exciting, don't you? Well, I'm glad you made it back in one piece. When was the last time the ship actually got some maintenance and TLC? At least you didn't have to sit in your hub all day. The trio shared a brief moment of camaraderie before Pamela gestured towards the food. Now, let's not keep the delicacies waiting. Dig in, gentlemen. Thompson and Gregory wasted no time in filling their trays with a mixture of colorful dishes. The mess hall buzzed with conversation as the crew enjoyed their meals, savoring the flavors that reminded them of home. Thompson took a bite of a dish that seemed to be made from some sort of ration mix, but transformed into something extraordinary under Pamela's skillful hands. He closed his eyes and savored the explosion of flavors in his mouth. Um, this is incredible, Thompson exclaimed, his voice filled with delight. She's managed to turn ship rations into a delicacy, yet again. I'm afraid to even ask what this originally was. Gregory, sitting across from him, nodded in agreement, his mouth full of food. I don't know how she does it, but this is pure magic. Captain Sarah Peterson entered the mess hall and all stood in salute, they remained in that position until she said, at ease. She approached the void runner's table, this spot taken? To which Thompson said no and Greg stood up to pull out her chair. All right enough with the formalities gentlemen, I take it nothing of import resulted from your shift. We did manage to survey that asteroid belt in set I-12. There seems to be an abnormal amount of nickel and cobalt in focused clusters around the belt. Probably worth investigating if you ask me. She thought for a second before saying, if my timeline ISNT flawed, we made good time, that detour shouldn't be far enough to throw us off schedule. Do you think your team has everything they need? I do, Greg replied, and I've actually already done the math and after crunching the numbers I think we can spend four hours without deviating from our contract schedule. It might boost morale if we had a little something to call a bonus. With the average rates on those two resources, just a few hours out there should yield some fruit. Speaking of morale, Gregory chimed in. I think I have some potential job prospects lined up, once we make it to a settled system and I can establish a comm link I'll check and see if it's still posted. Easy work, it's a security gig for some miners in the Granger system. The facility they need us to secure is located on a remote moon that can support life. The ecosystem there is fairly primordial, but they are worried about these armored predators that VE been raiding their camps. She looked at the men thoughtfully, we haven't had a security gig in a while, and this seems easy. We've had to deal with our share of armored critters so this should just be another run of the mill. Her voice was confident. Double check your data and report to me tomorrow. Now get some rest, don't be at the watering hole all night, this job is not paying nearly enough to keep us afloat. We need this side project, and I don't need you boys finding and fucking off the only opportunity we've found in months. Yes ma'am, they both said, saluting and gathering their chairs as they exited the mess hall. Gregory felt the toll of the day creeping up on him, an exhaustion causing incessant yawning repeating in cycles. Thompson disregarded the captain's advice and made his way to the watering hole the ship's hub for all debauchery and frolicking. He slipped into his usual seat at the end of the bar, he was greeted at the entrance by Meg the bartender. Tommy, have a seat. The usual? Yeah, put it on my tab, she looked him up and down, her keen eyes taking in more than what lie on the surface. Nonsense, she said. I can tell when a man needs a drink, otherwise what good would I be at my job? this one's on the house. Thank you Meg, you don't know how much I appreciate that. You know when I signed on for this crew, I thought the diversity of the jobs would break up the monotony. Don't get me wrong, sometimes I love my job. But other times I feel like my life and potential is being wasted. Have you ever felt like that? Every day of my life, 
Meg replied. Back on Mars I was the mixologist at a real high-end joint, I signed up with Calypso to see some of the universe I heard so much about. I can't compare our jobs, but listening to tales of adventures, pitfalls, love and war only made me want to see what it was all about even more. Here we are, same job, different location. The only difference is I guess I'm on that adventure. At least closer than I was at my old job. Plus, you guys have really grown on me. I almost feel like you all are my family. Thompson smirked, you are family Meg, I don't have anyone back home, no folks no wife no kids. This ship has been my world now for a few years. I wouldn't have it any other way, what would we do with some fun Nazi they bring in from some corporate dive bar? You are the best mixologist space side, hell you probably don't have much competition in all the settled systems. Between you and Jonas, this shit is blessed. The things she does with what little she has, and this magic right here. He swirled the pearl liquid around in his tumbler. Yes sir, we got the best of both worlds. Now, would you mind pouring me one more, I gotta take it easy tonight. We got an assignment in the morning that might brighten some of the moods around here. Yeah, we could use some of that, she replied, pouring him another two fingers of Malinor Velvet 2043. Damn some of the good stuff. She smiled, returning the bottle beneath the bar. Yeah I made sure to ration the good stuff, where at the end of this contract, I'll get a chance to stock up. No telling what I'll get my hands on at this next supply stop. He nodded his head, typed the generous number into his wrist display, and swiped it over hers. Transaction complete, have a good night Thompson. And he did, he now felt his bunk beckoning. Gregory tossed and turned in his bed, his mind restless with memories of his life before being a spacer. A term first mentioned on Earth when the beginning colonies went out to explore the galaxy. The dreamscape carried him back to his days on Titan, one of the many moons orbiting the gas giant in Sol. It was a place where routine and the vastness of space intertwined, leaving an indelible mark on his soul. In his dream, Gregory awoke on Titan, the thin atmosphere of the moon filtering through his sleeping quarters. He hastily threw on his gear, adjusting the face mask to fit snugly around his ears. Stepping outside, he found himself immersed in the labyrinthine streets of the colony, his destination a mundane job that mirrored the monotony of his everyday life. As he walked, his gaze instinctively turned skyward, drawn to the majestic gas giant that dominated the horizon. The rings encircling it mesmerized him, shimmering with an ethereal beauty. Today, however, something was different. The news he had heard the previous night echoed in his mind, promising a rare sight in the northwestern part of the sky. A blue dot amidst a sea of white. Gregory trained his eyes in that direction, his anticipation growing. How many stars out there held planets resembling home? It was a question that had always fascinated him, a reminder of humanity's place in the cosmos. Searching the heavens, he sought to distinguish that one blue dot from the countless others. And then, there it was. The blue marble of mankind, suspended in the vast expanse of space. It was a sight that both humbled and inspired him, igniting a sense of wonder within his soul bringing back all the memories of youth. With the image imprinted in his mind, he pushed open the doors of his workplace, returning to reality. His dream shifted, transitioning to a memory from a few months prior, a mining expedition. Gregory and his fellow spacers embarked, venturing into the depths of Titan's unforgiving quadrant in search of precious resources. It was a mission that tested their mettle, a dance between man and machine in the hostile environment of space. In his recollection, Gregory vividly remembered the harshness of the workplace, the biting cold that seeped through his suit, from the constant flow of oxygen. The rhythmic hum of the machinery that echoed through the cavernous tunnels they bore into mile-long asteroids. 
Each step was a test of their resilience, and the reliability of their technology. Mankind found out very soon after space travel that certain compounds and elements acted differently in zero gravity. Natural or inorganic, they managed to resource and create technologies far beyond the 20th century. After countless centuries of warfare, mankind had grown sick of their constant conflicts. At least with each other. In the late 2080s, Earthlings found themselves weary of the division that plagued its history. The scars of wars and meaningless differences had left their marks on societies across the globe, prompting a collective longing for unity and a shared purpose. It was during this time that the skies above Earth began to buzz with reports of unidentified flying objects, sparking curiosity and intrigue among the masses. The United States government, alongside other superpowers, recognized the need to investigate these UFO sightings and understand the nature of these visitors. In a remarkable show of collaboration, a multinational task force was assembled, pooling resources, intellect, and technological prowess to uncover the truth behind these celestial anomalies. What began as an endeavor to capture and study the UFO soon took an unexpected turn. Unbeknownst to humanity, their actions inadvertently triggered a conflict with the alien race behind the sightings. The extraterrestrial species, known as the Dex Remni, possessed technology far superior to anything humanity had ever encountered. Their spaceships traversed the cosmos effortlessly, their weaponry and defenses seemingly insurmountable. Yet, the Dex Remni had gravely underestimated the indomitable spirit and resourcefulness of humanity. Despite the technological disadvantage, mankind unleashed a raw and primal savagery that the aliens had never encountered before. The humans fought tooth and nail, driven by a fierce determination for victory at any cost. As the war escalated, the nations of Earth recognized the urgency and the need for a united front. Old rivalries and geopolitical disputes were cast aside as the shared goal of defeating the Dex Remni took precedence. Governments, scientists, and military forces collaborated like never before, pooling their knowledge and resources to combat the common enemy. The war raged on for fifteen intense and grueling years. Battles were fought in the vastness of space, with both sides sustaining significant losses. Humanity's resilience and adaptability, coupled with their newfound unity, proved to be their greatest assets. The Dex Remni were ill prepared for the resolve and ingenuity of their human adversaries. Finally, faced with mounting casualties and the unyielding onslaught of humanity, the Dex Remni were left with no choice but to surrender. Recognizing the futility of further conflict, peace negotiations ensued. Lessons were learned, wounds were healed, and a fragile peace was brokered between the two species. In the aftermath of the war, Earth and the Dex Remni embarked on a journey of mutual understanding and cooperation. The Dex Remni, humbled by the tenacity and brutality of mankind, recognized the value of unity and collaboration. In the half-light of the ship's dawn, Gregory awoke, his groggy eyes focusing on the familiar sight of the charging headgear on his desk. His synthetic alarm continued its rhythmic beeping, an unwelcome reminder of the day ahead. He rubbed his eyes and forced himself out of the bed, the cold metallic floor beneath his feet bringing a shiver to his body. He glanced at his digi-watch. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes to clock like in. Like a massive opening either metal plates for the part allowing them to pass through and close behind them. Beginning the undocking process. Thompson said, Gregory eyed the gauges. Everything's green let's go. The interior of the drone was filled with the soft hum of machinery and the occasional beep of the console. Thompson and Gregory were seated comfortably in their respective seats, their suits reflecting the soft glow of the console lights. Engineer Becker Chen was heard in their comms, remember we've had some hydraulic issues with right arm too. Be careful how much work you put it into. It looks like you got fuel for the next nine hours. Good luck gentlemen. 
their banter filled the small cabin, a light-hearted interplay that was part of their long-established protocol and space mining ritual. Fire her up, Greg, Thompson said with a grin, his hands already working the flight controls with ease. The drone shuddered slightly as it separated from the Calypso. Then, with a soft whir of engines, they were off, gliding through the vast emptiness towards the first asteroid. Just like reported it was a monolith of nickel. They found veins as wide as a human torso, the nickel shimmering under the drone's lights. Gregory, responsible for navigation and the drone's mechanical control arms, guided the arms to chip off slabs of material. This part of the job I don't mind as much, this is sort of like playing games back in Seoul. Greg said. Yeah but unlike in video games this is life or death so keep your mind on the mission buddy. Gotcha, he replied. They repeated the process with two more asteroids, one rich in iron and the other in nickel as well as iron. One out of two more asteroids before we need to turn back, Gregory stated, studying the energy readings on his console. Left or right? Thompson shrugged. Rock, paper, scissors? They played, their gloved hands forming the familiar shapes. Gregory won with paper over rock, and they decided to take the left one. As they approached, Gregory guided the control arms to retrieve a gleaming chunk of the asteroid's nickel ore. Then he set a small charge to detonate, a standard procedure to separate the various compounds within the asteroid. When the charge detonated, the asteroid split open, revealing something they hadn't quite expected. Hidden within the layers of the asteroid was the unmistakable sheen of palladium. Their eyes widened at the sight. Greg, you seeing this? Thompson asked, his voice filled with disbelief. I am, Gregory said, his fingers already moving over his console to confirm their discovery. The scanner confirmed it, they had hit a sizable deposit of palladium. Yeah baby. Kaiching. They shouted. Without wasting any more time, Gregory used the control arm to carefully place a sample of the palladium inside the drone's cargo bay. Then they started the journey back to the Calypso, their drone running on a mere 13% charge. The return trip was filled with tension, the drone's energy readings dipping lower with each passing minute. All right, cut the engines, Becca Chen chimed in over comms, you can drift from there, cycle the batteries into reserve mode. Thompson followed her commands hearing the whine of the M9 class drone engine spooling down. Finally they made it, the drone docking with the Calypso just as the energy readings hit zero. The last of the battery's power was used to maneuver it in place for the docking protocol. As they unbuckled from their seats, they could barely contain their excitement over their treasure. The airlock slid open with a soft hiss, revealing Gregory and Thompson, their eyes glinting with the thrill of success. As they stepped through the gateway from their mining drone, they were greeted not by the cold, sterile environment of the spaceship, but by an eruption of cheers and applause. Before them stood the rest of the crew, united in their excitement. Dr. Benjamin Gaines, the ship's dedicated scientist with a mind as vast as space itself, clapped his hands together, his normally serious demeanor giving way to a broad smile. Engineer Becca Chen, her hands always eager to mend and fix, whistled through the gaps in her fingers, the sound echoing through the otherwise quiet ship. Security officer Calvin Reynolds, a stalwart sentinel ever vigilant in his duty, allowed a rare grin to break out across his face. Ship navigator Ava LaGuardia, a woman as mysterious as the cosmos they sailed through, gave a nod of approval, her eyes sparkling with admiration. Henry and Alonzo, the two reliable crew members who kept the gears of the ship running smoothly, were already moving forward to help their comrades. The cheers didn't cease, but the work began nonetheless. Gregory and Thompson, still basking in the glory of their victory, moved with a newfound swagger, their steps echoing through the ship like the footsteps of superstars on a stage. 
They work together with a rhythm born of countless hours spent in the confines of the Calypso. The massive Palladium boulder, a gleaming piece to their hard work and the promise of wealth, was loaded into the cargo bay with a precision that only a well-coordinated team could achieve. This is a big one, you guys really did it this time. Good work, how much do you think this will be? Henry said Alonzo said his piece, I can tell you one thing, it might be enough for some R&R. &R. We found a nice platinum chunk a few years back and it was a pretty penny. This, I don't know. I don't think we're gonna be rich, but Alonzo might have a point you know. We might actually get some downtime after all. Thompson said. Greg smirked, do you wanna throw it up on the scale and do a rough estimate? We can reveal the rough numbers over Chow this evening. The shared thought among them was almost palpable, they were due for some fun and this will be the catalyst. The prospect of what they could do with the bounty was an intoxicating thought, a dream that had been brought to life in the form of the shimmering palladium find. 2. Captain, Ava said, in a light raspy voice. Yes, what is it? I'm trying to patch this code, I'm sick of getting these damn error messages every time I try to do my logs. I apologize, she said. The captain raised a hand, it's fine, continue please. I could use the distractions, before I kick this fucking whole contraption into vacuum and call it a day. She sighed, allowing Ava to report. It seems as if there's some type of comms problem with our drop-off. Of course, when does anything ever go according to plan around here? Ava looked troubled. What should we do Captain, protocol says we report this and remain in orbit while Section 7 investigates. She paused, hoping the Captain had more to offer than seasoning on the shit sandwich this was proving to be. Yeah that will fuck us, let's not do that yet. How many times and how long ago did you attempt to establish a comms link? We've attempted a connection every hour on the hour for the last eight. No response, I have a bad feeling about this. She paused. Well there is a bit of good news. And what is that navigator Ava? She smiled, well if Thompson and Greg's palladium weighs out, we might be able to persuade them to fill the reserve tanks and repair our jump drive. That would be nice the captain stated, her brow slowly unfurling as she deflated a bit from her statuesque posure. That would be a blessing, I'm sure the boys will chip in. It was a good find, minus Greg's bar habits. These boys haven't gone off contract or deviated from any of our objectives. They truly deserve a little time off ship. Hell, we all do. I think we might take a week or two to discuss said repairs and fuel. She continued. Owen oh, remained diligent in trying to contact them. We really don't want to bring Section 7 into this. That is a month of paperwork for no reason if there's just some interference with the single. Ava's expression changed. That would be impossible ma'am. She paused, it was the captain who spoke next. What do you mean, elaborate? How is it, she flexed two fingers on both hands to mimic quotation marks. Impossible, she drew out the word. The comms link is infinite loop tech, something developed on Mars decades ago. A part of that planet's core system's brain is in our ship's components. There is a quantum entanglement between the comms and the planet's side base. The other line is dead man, blank. Like someone is holding the button down and not saying anything. Reynolds thought he heard something once in the feed. We took some recordings and had our techs back in Sol evaluate them. And, the captain said, lifting an eyebrow. Where does that leave us navigator? I say we land and assess the situation, if there is something wrong on their end we help them patch it. If something is remotely off, I recommend reporting it to Section 7 Inch. Agreed, the captain said. Dismissing Navigator Ava to her duties. 
The mess hall of the Calypso was a haven of camaraderie and respite for the weary crew. Today, however, it was distinguished by an unusual silence, broken only by the soft murmur of low conversations. The reason for this unusual quietude was none other than Pamela, the ship's culinary genius. Time and time again, she managed to weave her expertise and grace into the most mundane of rations, transforming them into delectable delights that danced upon the crew's taste buds. Each bite was savored as if it were a precious treasure, and the crew remained silent, united in their shared gastronomic pleasure. Amidst this tranquil atmosphere, the mess hall doors swung open with a grandeur befitting the occasion. Gregory and Thompson strode in like titans, clutching a tablet that held the answers to their recent endeavors. Their faces bore the unmistakable glow of triumph, a testament to their success. The crew's collective gaze turned towards the duo, their eyes gleaming with anticipation. Gregory and Thompson had undertaken the formidable task of weighing the palladium boulder they had discovered during their mission. With bated breath, they had calculated its worth based on the current economic rates. As they unveiled the staggering numbers on the tablet, the room erupted in a symphony of gasps and whispers. The boulder, it seemed, held a value exceeding 440 million credits, a fortune beyond imagination. The crew exchanged glances, their minds racing with the possibilities that such a substantial sum could offer. Yet, the reality of their numbers quickly settled upon them. With ten members to share the bounty, the individual shares were still considerably large. 36.9 million credits to be exact. Gregory and Thompson, however, had already discussed and reached an agreement. They planned to set aside a portion of the fortune to ensure the continued maintenance and well-being of their beloved ship, the Calypso. It was a gesture that spoke to their dedication and loyalty to the vessel that had carried them through countless adventures. This number had already been factored in and the crew's split remained unaffected. The room, once shrouded in anticipation, brightened as the realization of their newfound wealth sank in. The crew's faces transformed from masked concern to genuine smiles. Just as the jubilant atmosphere reached its peak, the captain made her entrance. With an aura of authority and command, she strode into the mess hall, her presence demanding attention. The crew fell silent, their eyes fixed upon her, awaiting her next words. In light of our success on this mission, she began, her voice carrying a firm yet soothing tone. I have decided that each and every one of you deserves some well-earned downtime. A chorus of cheers erupted, filling the air with an infectious enthusiasm. The captain allowed the celebration to run its course before raising her hand, signaling for silence once again. But, she continued, her voice tinged with a hint of gravity, we have encountered a problem. Our loss of contact with the drop-off point is no mere glitch. The issue lies planet side. 3. Captain Patterson stood at the helm of the spacecraft, her gaze fixed on the desolate planet below. Navigator Ava, try one more time to bring up Alpha Base on the comms, Captain Jonas commanded, her voice tinged with concern. Ava nodded, her hand swiftly manipulating the controls. She initiated the communication protocol, but as before, the attempt yielded no response. Frustration crept into their hearts as they realized that their hopes of finding answers were dwindling with each failed attempt. With a sigh, Captain Patterson made a firm decision. Prepare for descent, Ava. We need to investigate the base ourselves. And just in case, begin preparations to patch through to Section 7. The spacecraft began its slow descent through the hazy atmosphere, the heat shields protecting it from the hostile environment. As they broke through the dense layer of clouds, a harsh and unforgiving landscape greeted their eyes. The surface below was ravaged and scarred, with volcanic features punctuating the desolation. And people have an outpost here, why? Gregory asked, Thompson was reading something in his HUD, he answered. 
according to the data this is a mining outpost and ground zero for the terraforming efforts. Gregory scoffed, yeah look how well that's going, he gestured to the beaten and acid-washed landscape before them. Prepare for landing, Captain Patterson commanded. She signaled for the landing gear to be lowered, and the spacecraft touched down on the acidic, baked land with a gentle thud. A cloud of alien soil billowed around them, momentarily obscuring their vision. Once the cloud settled, Thompson and Gregory suited up and prepared themselves for the trek to the base. Captain Patterson looked at them with a mix of concern and disbelief. You two really up for this, you two have earned the right to sit this one out. It's quite all right Captain. He said. This isn't our first rodeo, plus me and this geezer have been on ops like this before. We rather know it's being done right, not saying Alonzo couldn't handle this. But I feel like it should be us. Thompson, Gregory, you know what to do. Proceed cautiously, and report anything unusual or out of the ordinary, she instructed. They toggled their head cams and brought up the planet's reading on their HUDS. Through the communication system, Navigator Ava provided them with step-by-step -step guidance on how to unseal the base doors. Her voice was steady and reassuring, a lifeline in the silence that enveloped the planet. As Thompson and Gregory made their way towards the base, they couldn't help but be awestruck by the devastation that surrounded them. It was clear that whatever had happened here, it had been catastrophic. Signs of hasty evacuation were evident, abandoned equipment and personal belongings scattered haphazardly. Finally, they reached the entrance of Alpha Base. The heavy metal doors stood closed, a silent barrier guarding the secrets within. With Ava's guidance, they initiated the procedure to unseal the doors. The familiar sound of hydraulics filled the air as the doors creaked open, revealing the hazy partially lit interior. The silence that greeted them inside was deafening. The air felt heavy and stale, as if holding the weight of a thousand unanswered questions. The base was eerily empty, devoid of life and activity. It was evident that everyone had left in a hurry, leaving behind a sense of unease. Thompson and Gregory cautiously began their exploration of the base, their footsteps echoing through the empty corridors. They moved from room to room, searching for any signs of life or clues about what had transpired. As they delved deeper into the base, they discovered scattered documents, broken equipment, and signs of a struggle. It was evident that chaos had reigned within these walls before its inhabitants had fled. The once bustling hub of scientific research and exploration now lay in ruins. Are you seeing this? Gregory said into his comms. Yes, Ava reported. But we are not seeing any reason behind this conundrum. Thompson chimed in, it looks like there's a recording, there's a blinking light on the terminal. Captain Patterson's voice came through the earpiece, laced with an urgency that sent a chill down Gregory's spine. Press it, she said, her voice echoing slightly over the comms. He glanced over at Thompson, who returned the look with a firm nod, eyes glinting in the light of the control room. Taking a deep breath, Gregory reached out and pressed the blinking green button on the console in front of him. A recording began to play, the voice of the Alpha Base Overseer filling the room. It was a voice full of terror, cracking with every word, and it told a horrific tale. The overseer described how, a few months prior, their team had tapped into an unusually rich vein of precious metals. They had celebrated at first, overjoyed at the prospect of the results this find could bring. But the joy was short-lived. Soon after, they began experiencing tremors. Then the crew started showing strange symptoms. One by one, the members of the crew began to lose their minds. They committed unthinkable acts of violence, turning on themselves, and on each other. Suicides and murders became a frequent occurrence. The base, once a beacon of prosperity and hope, had transformed into a den of madness and horror. 
the overseer spoke about how he and a handful of trusted crew members had managed to barricade themselves into a room, their last bastion of sanity amidst the chaos. They could hear the others outside, their madness transformed into taunts and the terrifying sound of clawing at the door. As the recording neared its end, the terror in the overseer's voice reached a fever pitch. There was a horrendous noise in the background, a cacophony of rending steel and twisting metal. It was clear that some unknown force had broken through their barricade, turning their sanctuary into a slaughterhouse. The recording ended abruptly, leaving a haunting silence in its wake. Gregory and Thompson sat in stunned silence, the reality of what they had just heard sinking in. The Alpha Base wasn't just a failed mining operation, it was a nightmare come to life. But where's all the blood? Thompson asked. Impotent with fear, Gregory stood stunned in silence. Immediately, Ava began the process of reporting their findings to Section 7. This time, it was their own communication systems that were offline. Captain, something is scrambling any attempt at receiving and rendering any type of signal. Ava quickly began searching for anything that could make this situation less foobar. She connected to Greg and Thompson. Report back, our readings say there is a storm coming this way, and on this planet that is saying something. Unless you two wanna be melted or shredded by sharp debris, I recommend you get back here on the double. Despite the intensity of the alien storm sweeping over the planet, Gregory and Thompson wasted no time in heading back to the Calypso. The planet's hazy atmosphere made the ship barely visible in the distance, and the storm's acidic properties nipped at their heels, threatening to eat through them entirely. A glance over their shoulders revealed a sight of sheer terror, they were just minutes away from being swallowed by the alien tempest. A lightning bolt as thick as a man's torso exploded behind them, its deafening crack echoing through the desolate landscape. The passing shock wave of its electrical current scrambled their HUDs, causing the display to flicker momentarily. They pressed on, spurred by the urgency of their situation. Once inside the Calypso, they convened in the planning room, their faces etched with worry. Captain Sarah Patterson and ship's navigator Ava pored over the communication system, trying to determine what had caused their comms to go silent. The atmosphere was tense as they analyzed the data, the room filled with the hum of the ship's systems and the distant rumble of the storm outside. Ava broke the silence. It's possible one of the boost arrays is off-axis, she said. It could be causing a fluctuation in the frequencies. Thompson, his brow furrowed in thought, asked, is there a way to reorient them? Ava nodded, her face serious. Yes, but it won't be easy. The storm is causing too much interference. But yes, there is a chance that could be causing this. It fits at least. And aside from the technical difficulties, we're going to have to wait for the planet-wide storm to dissipate before we can do anything. Captain Jonas added. There's no way we can perform an EVA in these conditions. Gather the crew. Patterson entered the lounge area, shattering the tense silence that had settled over the spaceship. Crew, she began, her voice steady and commanding despite their circumstances. A trait the crew had by now grown accustomed to. We are currently stranded, and our communication beyond our personal comms has been compromised. A murmur of consternation rippled through the crew, but no one spoke up. They were a dedicated team, handpicked by Captain Patterson herself, and they trusted her to guide them through the most treacherous of circumstances. Ava Laguardia and Becca Chen have been tirelessly working on solutions since the alarms notified us. They theorized a malfunction in one of the boost arrays as the main cause of their predicament on Alpha. Once we're through this planet-wide storm, we will start repairs, Patterson continued. This storm will make any takeoff attempts impossible, so we're here for the night at least. The news was met with quiet acceptance. They had faced worse situations and survived. This was just another challenge. 
I've issued extra rations for the night. We don't know if the people we're supposed to meet are still here, or if they're dead. But we do know that our cargo is here, and we indicated that upon arrival. The credits for our service have cleared. We will do whatever kind of supply run we need to before we leave this planet, as soon as the storm passes. The crew members nodded, already moving to their stations to prepare for the ordeal ahead. But remember, priority one will be fixing those arrays, Patterson added, her gaze sweeping over her crew. We're not leaving until we're fully operational and so is Alpha. We're all in this together. Are we clear? Yes ma'am. 4. Ava Laguardia retreated to her personal quarters, a meager 6x10 space that, despite its size, was home nonetheless for her during the long, interstellar journeys. As the storm raged outside, pelting the ship's hull with relentless ferocity, she was reminded of her home world. A terraformed moon that circled Saturn, its ring beauty was far more ominous than it appeared, much like the storm they were currently weathering. Navigating the cosmos was her life, the telemetry data, the software, the preciseness of it all. But it wasn't her whole existence. She also had an affinity for the arts, for the emotional and cultural nuances of poetry. During her downtime, she'd often lose herself in the pages of books, absorbing words that painted pictures far beyond the cold starlight and metallic confines of the ship. Tonight, as the acidic rain fell outside, she was drawn into contemplation. This rain was far from the comforting moisture of her home world, it would strip the flesh from her bones if it were to touch her. She thought of the wind, how it carried shards of sharp rock and microscopic debris that would lodge into the smallest crevices, never to be removed. She was pulled from her thoughts by sounds next door. The familiar laughter, the occasional argument, it was undoubtedly Thomas and Alonso, playing cards as they usually did. Something Gregory sucked at and was never present for their games and debauchery. She could almost see their faces, animated in the heat of the game, their gamut a balm against the unforgiving harshness of our there. A part of her yearned to join them, to share in their laughter, their bickering, their drinks. She knew they had something stashed away, something to take the edge off the anxiety the storm brought. Yet, she chose solitude, preferring to stay alone in her quarters. The sound of their merriment, while comforting, would only serve to drown out the rhythmic patter of the acidic rain on the ship, a sound that, in its own strange way, brought her comfort, Chapter 10, Echoes from the Past. Gregory, ensconced in the frosty solitude of his quarters, was a lone island amidst the spaceship's sea of activity. The raucous laughter and playful banter of Thompson and Alonso echoed down the corridor, a stark contrast to his own solitude. The pull to join them was strong, a gnawing temptation at the edge of his alcohol-addled consciousness. But the bottle had him in its cruel, unyielding grip making the prospect of navigating the ship's companionway seem as daunting as scaling a mountain. His vision swam, the world around him wavering like a mirage. His wrist tablet, a fixture on his arm, was a blurred mess of pixels and light. He squinted, his blurry gaze stubbornly trying to sharpen the image displayed on the screen. If his eyes had been cooperative, they would have met the youthful, smiling faces of his ex-wife and their daughter. The young girl in the picture was just four, her life barely a spark in the grand scheme of things. Now, she was a teenager, her young life playing out in a world he no longer belonged to. He remembered the day the picture was taken, the memory of a bittersweet melody that played over and over in his mind. Sorrow and regret, like old friends, kept him company as he drowned his sorrows. The rhythmic sound of the acidic rain against the spaceship's hull was a metronome, setting the tempo for his drunken reverie. It was a harsh, alien sound, yet it comforted him in its familiarity, its consistency. Lost in this strange meditation, Gregory was a man adrift on the sea of his past, each droplet of rain a reminder of choices made paths taken, and the life he'd left behind. 
the Calypso offered no escape from his memories, only the cold comfort of isolation. Chief Security Officer Calvin Reynolds, a seasoned veteran of the Interstellar Fleet, carried out his rounds with the same meticulous precision he'd maintained for the past six years aboard the Calypso. His tenure had been, for the most part, uneventful, a fact that he mentally acknowledged as he patrolled the ship's sterile, metallic corridors. His role had evolved over the years, transitioning from an enforcer of peace to a more supportive role. The crew of the Calypso, a harmonious bunch, rarely quarreled, and those who did were swiftly weeded out. Calvin relished his newly adopted role, ensuring that everyone else could comfortably and effectively carry out their duties. As he paced through the hallway, he noted the relative quiet of the ship. The crew members were mostly nestled in their individual quarters, the exceptions being Alonzo and Thompson. Their raucous laughter echoed down from the far end of the corridor, signaling the climax of their regular card game. Ahead, the soft glow of Dr. Benjamin Gaines' laboratory caught Calvin's attention. The reclusive doctor was an enigmatic figure on the ship, often opting for the solitude of his lab over social interaction. Yet, in an ironic twist, he and Calvin had managed to form a unique bond. Their shared stoicism had birthed an unlikely camaraderie, and it had become a routine for Calvin to drop by the lab during his rounds. As he stepped into the lab, the doctor looked up from his work, a faint smile playing on his lips. Evening, Calvin, he greeted, before turning his gaze back to his microscope. Still burning the midnight oil, I see, Calvin commented, eyeing the storm raging outside the ship's viewing port. The heavens were ablaze with electric discharges, the acidic atmosphere of the planet churning violently. Dr. Gaines glanced at the storm and sighed, a look of longing in his eyes. Can you imagine the samples I could collect out there? Calvin chuckled, shaking his head. You wouldn't catch me dead out in that. The doctor laughed, adjusting his glasses. Ah, Calvin, but what a way to go. The opportunity to first-hand witness the chemical reactions and study the acidic properties, it's a scientist's dream. Well, doctor, Calvin replied with a grin, you can keep your dreams. I'll stick to the safety of the Calypso. It's quiet enough here. So, Ben, what's the plan when we finally get our hands on those near 40 million credits? Calvin asked, breaking the silence. Benjamin paused his examination for a moment, a mischievous smile playing at the corners of his lips. Ah, the age-old question, my friend. Well, I've always had a soft spot for exotic vacations and fine dining. Perhaps a trip to the picturesque beaches of Lexan Prime? Or maybe a dining experience at the famed Nebula Bistro, he mused, his eyes sparkling with excitement. Calvin chuckled, shaking his head. You and your lavish tastes, Ben. I'm more of a simple man. I'd probably invest in some property, maybe start a small farm on one of the outer colonies. Live off the land, you know? Benjamin raised an eyebrow, his gaze lingering on Calvin for a moment. A farm, huh? That's an interesting choice. I suppose it's a good way to escape the chaos of the universe. But you know, Calvin, there's something to be said for embracing the luxuries every once in a while. Life's too short not to indulge a little. Calvin smirked, his eyes glinting with amusement. Ah, but that's where you're wrong, my dear doctor. Life's too short to be caught up in materialistic pursuits. The true joy lies in the simple pleasures, like a good book or a quiet walk under the stars. Benjamin chuckled, his fingers deftly adjusting a tiny dial. You always have a way of making me question my priorities, Calvin. Perhaps there's more to life than just the grand adventures and extravagant luxuries. Maybe it's the small moments that truly matter. Either way I will shamelessly indulge in my own debauchery on my own time. You're catching on, my friend, Calvin replied, 
a hint of satisfaction in his voice. Life's a journey, and it's the little day tours and unexpected encounters that make it worthwhile. Fuck this job has really been an eye-opener. I couldn't have found a better place in my career if I tried to. Amidst their discussions, Benjamin couldn't help but ponder the uncanny luck of their colleagues, Thomas and Gregory, who always seemed to stumble upon remarkable discoveries by accident. It was an irony that wasn't lost on him. You know, Calvin, Benjamin mused, his eyes twinkling with amusement, I've always been skeptical about luck. But with Thomas and Gregory, I can't help but wonder if there's something to it. Maybe they have a cosmic connection to serendipity. Calvin raised an eyebrow, a faint smile tugging at his lips. The scream echoed through the metallic innards of the spaceship, a chilling sound that sent a frigid jolt through security officer Ree Noyles. He barked at Dr. Gaines, his voice brimming with authority, stay here, seal the lab. Just in case. The doctor nodded, a look of dread etched on his features as he complied without question. Ree Noyles could hear the ominous symphony of acidic rain pelting against the spaceship's hull, a haunting melody that toyed with his mounting fears. His hand instinctively reached for his PK-99 particle beam pistol, a comforting weight against the uncertainty. He unholstered the weapon, his grip firm and steady as he trained it down the hall, the overhead lights flickering intermittently. He moved swiftly, his boots echoing on the cold floor as he approached the junction ahead. As he turned the corner, pistol at the ready, he was met with the unexpected sight of Pamela Jonas, the ship's nutrition specialist. She stood frozen in front of Henry's quarters, her face a mask of shock and horror. The sound of chaos echoed from inside the room, a cacophony of destruction that sent adrenaline surging through Ree Noyle's veins. He hurried to Pamela's side, his eyes darting into the room to take in the scene of devastation. Henry was there, his belongings, the reminders of his life on earth and all he held dear, were being violently smashed against the walls and floor. His laughter was manic, a chilling soundtrack to the scene of self-destruction. Henry. Renoilds yelled, his voice echoing in the small quarters. Calm down. The madman paused, his laughter dying in his throat as he slowly turned to face the security officer. His eyes held a look that sent a shiver down Renoilds' spine, a look of a predator ready for the kill. Time seemed to slow as Henry lunged, not at Reynolds, but at the petrified Pamela. His hands were outstretched, reaching for her throat with a deadly intent. Renoilds had only seconds to react, a split second to make the impossible choice. He pulled the trigger. The sound of the particle beam pistol filled the room, a loud, final punctuation to the madness. Henry's head exploded in a shower of gore, his body dropping limply to the floor. The echoes of the gunshot reverberated through the ship, the sound of the acidic rain on the hull a grim undertone to the sudden silence. Renoilds lowered his weapon, his heart pounding as he stared at the lifeless body of Henry. Sweet baby Jesus, what the fuck, what in the actual fuck? Calvin lowered his gun. Everyone on the ship stood silently in the hall. After a while it was Alonzo that acted. He looked down at his dear friend. He was closer to him than anyone else on the ship. They had been friends far before either one of them had set foot on board, Calypso. Now he carries his closest thing to a brother he had ever known to the already preparing doctor. Once he heard the shot, even behind the sealed door. Instead of cowering he began prepping the bay for a wounded patient. He was not expecting the severity. Calvin never wanted to take a life, but when faced with the choice, he had acted without hesitation. It had been Henry or Pamela Jones, and he couldn't bear the thought of the latter lying lifeless on this very table. But now, as he stared at the headless body, his thoughts were consumed by regret. He wasn't Henry's friend by any means, but they shared drinks and a few games. And this is not a circumstance he would have ever imagined. 
not only in his life, but in the moments where he sat across the table. This man was not Henry, whatever happened had whipped that man. Calvin looked down at his hands, and even though he had followed protocol he felt like a murderer. Dr. Gaines, normally a composed and rational man, was equally troubled. He had spent years studying the human mind, searching for answers to the countless mysteries it and the body held. As well as his doctorate in consciousness studies and links with cosmic alignments. That one he got just for the jest. Yet, the lack of a head on Henry's body left him baffled. How could he examine the man's brain for clues to the violent, animalistic behavior that had possessed him sporadically? The chaos had erupted with startling swiftness. One moment, Dr. Gaines and Calvin were engaged in a conversation. The next, the deafening gunshot that had put an end to Henry's rampage. Dr. Gaines was grateful that he hadn't witnessed the gruesome act firsthand, but now he found himself facing the gruesome truth. What happened Pamela, she stood shaking and petrified, by now Captain Patterson had entered and uncharacteristically put her arm around Pam. Dr. Gaines adjusted his glasses, his brow furrowing in deep thought. He approached the table where Henry's remains lay, covered by a blood-stained sheet. I'm sorry, forgive my straightforwardness. I do not mean to be insensitive Pam, I just wish to understand what could have gotten into the man. I swear I just spoke to the man four hours ago. They would have seen any signs of psychosis or any oncoming illness. My implant would have told me so. He tapped on his temple, scanning the body. Even through the sheets he could see the colors shifting and revealing the chemical and elemental influences on his anatomy. And his visual display. He saw the numbers and readings of all the various, ongoing processes after death. Forgive me he said, looking down at the body. I won't lift the sheet, but I have to submit my report. He continued. I have conducted a comprehensive post-mortem analysis on the remains of our crew member, Henry, he began, his gaze focused on the holographic display projected from his implant. Upon initial examination, it is evident that the subject exhibited alarming levels of psychosis and violent behavior before the catastrophic loss of the top portion of his head. What is most striking, however, are the chemical anomalies within his body. Note that, for the record. Security officer Calvin Reynolds acted in defense of another crucial member of the ship. Calypso 1104X Class K, contracted under the United Colonies. Date of incident. 8865 Sol. He paused and engaged a troubled look to Patterson before continuing. Dr. Gaines continued his fingers deftly manipulating the holographic controls to highlight the relevant data in his implant. Remarkably, despite the severe trauma, there is an abnormal amount of adrenaline still present in the subject's system. Approximately four times the physiological limits of a normal human's natural production. He paused, allowing the gravity of this revelation to settle in. This excessive adrenaline secretion, he continued implies that Henry's body was subjected to an intense state of fight-or-flight response, far beyond what the human body can endure. It is a crucial piece of the puzzle, suggesting an external influence or a profound alteration within his physiological makeup. Dr. Gaines knew that this revelation would raise further questions, suspicions, and uncertainties among the crew. But it was his duty to uncover the truth, no matter how unsettling it might be. With a final glance at the body of Henry and a samba nod to the captain, he concluded, the circumstances surrounding Henry's death remain deeply enigmatic, and I urge caution and vigilance as we seek to understand the full extent of this anomaly. Calvin, watching from a distance, couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled over him like a shroud. He had faced danger many times in his role as a security officer, but this was something altogether different. It was as if a malevolent force had taken control of their once peaceful existence. 
he felt lost, in the black infinitude of nothingness this planet represented. This planet was meant to eventually develop into a high-security prison. Its gravity was 2% higher than Earth's, and the storms lasted from hours to months depending on its location along the orbit of its host star. It existed on the far edge of the star's influence. The elliptical orbit of its trajectory made it cross paths with another behemoth of a planet. The magnetic forces and gravitational forces sometimes caused the planet to go through drastic changes. It was midway through one such cycle. Dr. Gaines took a deep breath, was it some alien force they had encountered during their journey through the cosmos? Or was it something far more insidious, lurking within the depths of this fucking base? The questions chewed at his mind like hungry termites. All crew are to gather in the lounge area for the night, Captain Patterson announced, her words resounding in the ears of each crew member. Until we can ascertain the nature of what has affected Henry, it's imperative that we stay together, for our safety and for the sake of this threat. We have little to go off of here, but everything since we got to this planet have gone to shit. I can't lose any more of you, regardless of how you may feel. I care about you people and don't wish to see harm come upon you, we have to organize and gather some ground here. As her orders were given, time seemed to slow to a samba crawl. The ship's inhabitants moved in a collective haze, their thoughts burdened by both grief and the unshakable fear of what might come next. Pamela's anguished screams still echoed in their minds, a haunting refrain that refused to fade. Everyone stole glances at her, she was still visibly shaken by the whole thing. Alanzo approached and nearly startled her when he did. Hey, I'm sorry you had to see that. She looked up at him with teary eyes. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry it had to happen. I was there. I saw the look in his eyes. He wasn't there. Henry was gone. I know you don't believe me, but it wasn't him. He hugged her close, she was stiff at first, then melted into sobs. Her tears he willingly absorbed and tried to hold her close as he did. It's okay, he tried to say, she cut him off before he could say any more. I'm sorry Alonzo, but none of this is okay. Something happened to those people inside. There's no reason that base should be abandoned. We were supposed to drop off necessary supplies. We were on a tight schedule. None of this makes sense. And what happened to Henry makes all of this worse. What don't we know? What is happening? In the lounge area, crew members gathered in silence, their expressions ranging from sorrow to trepidation. They had all heard the shots, seen the chaos unfold, and now they waited, bound by the uneasy knowledge that something malevolent lurked among them. Amidst the collective sorrow, engineer Becca Chen, her typically vibrant demeanor now tempered by the insanity, ventured to the corridor outside Henry's quarters. With meticulous care, she inspected the walls and the floor, ensuring that the shot fired by Reynolds had not breached the ship's hull. The prospect of an additional catastrophe weighed heavily on her. She admitted to herself the experience would serve as a worthy distraction from the mounting chaos. This wasn't the last of the strangeness and it was all she could do to not drown in memory of childhood nightmares. So she busied herself with any task she could find, practically searching for something to occupy her mind and hands. The corridor was eerily silent, as the crew settled into the lounge, Captain Patterson remained vigilant, her eyes scanning the faces of her crew. She sat at the command console, watching the zoomed and enhanced real-time live feed, and on repeat in another window. The split screen of the hallway and interior of Henry's quarters. She saw that her crew were uneasy, but following her orders. She knew Calvin would by now be at least not so far gone in self-doubt he wouldn't be searching the room for any signs of strangeness. She turned her attention to the footage of Henry sitting on his bed before the incident, he seemed to be normal. 
when she zoomed in she could see he was talking to himself under his breath. Calypso, she said to the ship's AI, can you read his lips, or turn up this audio? I can do both, but either are irrelevant, the ship replied, elaborate, she said back. Henry is speaking no known language in the settled colonies. He is hardly speaking at all actually, he keeps going back and forth between articulations and indescribable noises. Indescribable noises, she repeated. Fluttering her fingertips on the console. 5. Captain Patterson stood tall, the fluorescent lights flickered overhead, mirroring the tension that filled the air. As it turned out, the storm was relentless, the acidic precipitation having only just dissipated. But someone had to venture outside to ascertain the state of the boost arrays. Becca Chen was the first to step forward, her seriousness evident in her firm stance. But the captain was quick, raising a hand to halt her. I'm sorry, Becca, she apologized. Your role here on the ship is too important to risk. Becca conceded with a nod, her disappointment well masked. Thompson and Gregory stepped up next. They were met with approving nods from Captain Patterson and a room full of their peers. We'll need Becca to guide you through the repair process once you've located the arrays, the captain informed them. Her gaze was firm as she added, they should be on the highest peaks surrounding Alpha Base. Tension gripped the room as the two prepared to venture into the storm. The suit-up process was a meticulous one, requiring both physical and mental preparedness. Each suit was a marvel of engineering, designed to withstand the harshest of elements. First came the base layer, a tight-fitting suit that monitored vital signs and regulated body temperature. Next was the mid-layer, filled with a network of tiny tubes carrying a liquid coolant that could be activated if temperatures rose too high. Finally, the outer shell, a composite blend of lightweight materials meant to provide protection from physical damage without hindering mobility. Once the suits were on, Becker approached with a handheld device, its nozzle filled with a specially formulated substance. She explained that it would add a layer of protection against any residual acidic elements. The device hummed to life and she began to methodically spray Thompson and Gregory, working from head to toe. The substance was a luminescent blue and as it met with the suits, it adhered instantly, forming a thin, flexible layer. It shimmered slightly under the lights, giving off an ethereal glow. As it cured, the glow faded, leaving behind a suit that looked much like it had before, but was now considerably more resistant to acidic damage. As the airlock depressurized, Thompson and Gregory steeled themselves for the task that lay ahead. With a final hiss, the door opened, revealing a world painted in hues of orange and red by the storm, a stark contrast to the sterile environment they had just left behind. The acid rain had dwindled to a light drizzle, the drops sizzling as they made contact with their treated suits. The wind was their biggest adversary, whipping around them with a ferocity that spoke volumes of the planet's hostility. It carried with it an array of heavy metals and stone shards, all sharp-edged and deadly. They knew they had to minimize exposure to these natural projectiles. You ready old friend, Gregory said. Not really but let's do this, I just want off this rock. Thompson replied. Their vision was limited to only a few meters ahead due to the orange haze. The ridgelines they were tasked to scan seemed like elusive shadows in the distance. Gregory scoffed, we're never going to find anything stumbling around like idiots, he said, frustration evident in his tone. Thompson asked for his suggestion, to which Gregory replied. We need to get on the ground level of the spine of the ridge and walk its length until we find the boost array. Thompson agreed that the plan was sound but reminded Gregory about the incidents on the ship and the mysterious disappearances. Do you think it's wise to separate under such circumstances? he asked. Gregory's response was punctuated by a gust of cosmic wind that howled through the comms. You're probably right, he admitted, 
but if we don't get this done quickly, we'll be stuck here. The longer we're here, the more shit hits the fan. Gregory squinted through the thick, swirling orange haze, his mask covered in debris. On the opposite ridge line, he could barely make out the faint figure of Thompson wavering in and out of focus. Ava's voice crackled over the cons in his ear, providing updates on their situation. Gregory, Thompson, the storm's intensity is increasing. You both need to hurry. Our sensors show the acid rain will hit full force in less than an hour. Gregory adjusted his grip on the repair tools he held tightly and responded, copy that, Ava. We'll do our best. This shit is hard to navigate, I'm not sure what you can make out on my feed, but I'll tell why eh? it ain't much better from my position. Thompson, a few hundred meters away, fought against the relentless wind as he reached his designated location. He breathed a sigh of relief when he saw the boost array still standing, its metal frame bent but intact. He checked the lights he was directed to examine by Ava. Once through the checklist and satisfied it was in working order, she patched back in with Greg directly. Gregory reached his designated spot, only to find a disheartening sight. The boost array on his ridge line lay in shambles, hewn to parts like a broken toy. Gregory, frustrated said, Ava, my boost array is a wreck. This is going to take longer than I thought. And fuck me if it ain't completely totaled. Ava, with a concerned tone said, Gregory, time is running out. We need that boost array operational. Engineer Chen is here to guide you through it. Over the comms, Engineer Chen's accented voice chimed in, her tone calm but determined. Gregory, I'm here to help. First, locate the main power coupling. It should be near the base of the array. Gregory knelt down in the gusty winds, his fingers trembling as he worked to locate the power coupling. Chen's voice provided a lifeline of guidance in this chaotic storm. That's it, Gregory. Now, carefully inspect the coupling for any damage. You might need to replace it if it's compromised. As Gregory examined the coupling, he couldn't help but steal a glance across the chasm at Thompson, who was diligently maneuvering down the hill. Thompson, shouting over the wind said, Gregory, how's it going? Gregory strained, not great, Thompson. This coupling is fried. I'll need a replacement from the supply crate. Hurry, Gregory. The radar shows the acid rain closing in faster than expected. Captain Patterson said in a firm commanding shout. Gregory scrambled to retrieve the spare coupling from the supply crate, all the while battling the relentless gusts and the forceful push of the air. Engineer Chen continued to guide him through the intricate repair process. That's it, Gregory declared with a sense of accomplishment in his voice, coupling restored. Beads of sweat dripped down his forehead as he tightened the final screws on the repaired electronic system of the array. Becca Chen, replied with a mixture of relief and encouragement, good work, Gregory. Now, power it up and let's hope for the best. Meanwhile, Thompson had descended to the ground level and was now gazing back up at the formidable ridge line he'd just conquered. The expanse of Alpha Base sprawled before him, a desolate landscape of rocks and dust. He felt like he just ran a marathon to get to another marathon. He began his journey toward the other ridge line where Gregory was laboring. Step by step, Thompson battled against the relentless winds, pushing forward with as much resolve as he could manifest. Finally, as he reached the pinnacle and joined Gregory, his eyes widened at the sight beyond. In the distance, a stark difference in color marked the approaching return of the precipitation. The hues of orange grew darker, more foreboding, like a shadow creeping across the land. Thompson's helmet displayed this ominous panorama to the waiting crew on the Calypso. Ava Laguardia's voice cut through the tension over the comms, urgent and laced with anxiety, Thompson, what you see? That discoloration, that's the density of the acid rain. 
It's coming, you guys need to hurry. Gregory, overhearing this, felt a shiver of dread. With the last piece of broken chassis secured over the repaired array, he wasted no time in abandoning his tools and supplies. The storm was bearing down on them, and time was their most ruthless opponent. Let's get the fuck out of here buddy, Thompson shouted, the urgency in his voice matching the pounding of his heart. Together, the two men sprinted across the unforgiving terrain, glancing over their shoulders at the advancing wall of acid rain. It was like a cruel spectre, relentless and unforgiving, devouring everything in its path. Through the relentless orange haze, the light from the calypso beckoned like a distant sanctuary. They raced toward it, driven by a primal instinct to survive, like moths drawn to a beckoning flame. They reached the hatch of the spaceship just in the nick of time, their breaths labored, their faces sculpted with fear. They sealed the airlock just as the storm's intensity kicked into high gear, the deafening sound of rain pelting against the spaceship's hull ringing in their ears. In the light of the spaceship's interior, Gregory and Thompson exchanged glances, their laughter tinged with a surreal, desperate edge. They knew they danced with death, and the spectre had nearly claimed them. But as they expected a grand entrance, the cheers, an applause that had greeted their earlier triumph with the boulder of Palladium were conspicuously absent. Instead, the crew's faces wore expressions of sheer disbelief and astonishment. It was clear that, in the cruel grasp of Alpha Base Fury, their narrow escape had been nothing short of a miracle. And in that moment, as they stood among their astounded comrades, Gregory and Thompson were acutely aware that they had glimpsed the abyss, and the abyss had stared back. In the mess hall, the crew gathered, their faces plastered with sorrow and fatigue. Alonzo, still grappling with the recent loss of Henry, sat alone at a corner table, an island of solitude amidst the sea of empty chairs. His eyes were distant, haunted by memories he couldn't escape. Ava Laguardia, perceptive as ever, spotted Alonzo's isolation and decided to bridge the gap. She approached him, hoping her presence wouldn't offend. Without a word, she took a seat beside him, a silent gesture of support in their shared grief. Across the room, Thompson and Gregory sat side by side barely able to think of what to say. Dr. Benjamin occupied his usual spot, his brow furrowed in deep contemplation. Calvin Reynolds, the stoic security officer, sat nearby, his gaze fixed on his untouched meal. Silently, the crew members began to eat Pamela's cooking, though it lacked the love and usual grace that had once defined her meals. Each bite felt heavy, a reminder of the events that had unfolded. The clinking of cutlery against plates filled the air, but conversation was conspicuously absent. They all awaited the arrival of Becca Chen, the engineer, and Captain Patterson. Their absence hung over the room like a shroud, the minutes ticked by, the crew's collective grief and silence deepened. Secretly all in the room had shared the same thought, who's next? In the entirety of the Calypso's history, this night would be remembered as the quietest it had ever been. A hush had descended upon the spaceship, settling like a heavy, oppressive shroud. Every crew member, weary and anxious, sought refuge in the ship's lounge. Ava Laguardia and Becca Chen had claimed the couches, their eyes heavy with the weight of their shared exhaustion. Around the room, the rest of the crew had dragged their mattresses from their personal quarters, creating a patchwork of makeshift campsites. It was as if they were trying to recreate the comfort of their own sleeping quarters but the tension in the air made it clear that true comfort was a distant memory. Outside, the relentless acid rain continued its assault on the ship's hull. The corrosive downpour was relentless, as if the universe itself had conspired to test the limits of their sanity. Inside the lounge, the hum of the ship's engines was barely audible. They had been switched to recycling mode, a rare occurrence that only added to the sense of unease. Even Captain Patterson, the steely commander of the Calypso, had abandoned her post to sleep among her crew. 
the fear of the unknown had driven them all to seek solace in each other's presence, to find some semblance of safety in numbers. Two hours after Captain Patterson had finally let sleep claim her in their relentless battle against exhaustion, she was roused from her uneasy slumber by a persistent knocking sound. At first, it was a distant echo, barely registering in her sleep addled mind. But as the seconds ticked by, the knocking grew louder, more insistent, and impossible to ignore. With a start, Captain Patterson sat up, her heart racing. She scanned the dimly lit lounge, finding her crew members equally bewildered and alarmed by the unexpected intrusion. She raised a finger to her lips, urging them into silence, and the room fell into a tense hush. The knocking persisted, a rhythmic pattern that seemed to reverberate through the ship's metal walls. It was coming from somewhere within the Calypso, and it was undeniable. Captain Patterson, her senses sharpened by fear, rose from her makeshift mattress. Her crew followed suit, each of them grabbing whatever makeshift weapon they could find, be it a tool or a heavy-duty flashlight. Together, they moved cautiously toward the source of the sound, their breaths shallow, their nerves frayed. The labyrinthine corridors of the spaceship echoed with the knocking, a rhythmic thud that seemed to call Captain Patterson and her crew to a destination unknown. Like a spectral Pied Piper, the sound led them on a winding path through the heart of the ship, their footsteps in synchronized tiptoeing, reminiscent of a cosmic rendition of a Scooby-Doo chase sequence. They followed Captain Patterson, their eyes wide with apprehension, their breaths held in suspense. The knocking grew louder and more insistent as they neared the observation room, nestled like a forgotten relic at the ship's rear. The silence amplifying the knocking that now sounded like a desperate plea. Before Captain Patterson could take a decisive step forward, a firm hand clamped down on her shoulder. Turning, she found herself looking into the steely gaze of security officer Reynolds. With a curt nod, he took the lead, pushing the door open with a calculated force. The room stood surprisingly empty, a tableau of abandoned seats and blank screens. The crew gawked into the void, their faces a study in stupefaction. Without warning, a hand slapped against the porthole view, sending a shockwave through the room. The crew collectively jumped. Undeterred, Reynolds took a step closer, his face hardening into a mask of determination. As he did so, the figure at the window stepped back, revealing itself in the stark light of the surrounding storm. It was Henry. He moved forward with an eerie calmness, stepping into the raging storm outside. The crew watched, frozen in horror, as the acid rain began to eat away at his skin, his flesh dissolving into a gruesome spectacle of destruction. His skeleton, bleached and stark against the darkness, collapsed onto the ground, the acid rain sizzling against the remnants. And yet, through it all, Henry wore a peaceful smile on his face, a tranquil expression that seemed wildly out of place amid the violent scene unfolding outside. Even after death his skull still upheld the smile. 6. Dr. Benjamin Gaines sat in his lab his hands clenched in his hair as if he was trying to physically hold on to his unraveling sanity. His gaze kept flitting to the cold, empty slab where Henry's ravaged body should have been. Each time, his mind would flash back to that serene smile Henry wore, an image that seemed to be burned onto the insides of his eyelids. Gaines had always been a man of logic, a man of science. His life was built on cold, hard facts, rational thoughts, and decisions driven by logic. He had even managed to construct a scientific explanation for the existence of God. Yet, this, this surreal event was so far outside the realm of reality as he knew it, it threatened to fracture his very understanding of the universe. Security Officer Reynolds paused at the threshold of the lab, his brow furrowed as he observed the doctor's distress. It tore at Reynolds' heart to see Gaines in such a state, but he knew the doctor well enough to understand that he needed his own time and space to process this unfathomable event. Reynolds himself was still reeling from the day's events. 
he was the one who had pulled the trigger on Henry, and then watched, helplessly, as his friend's corpse walked into the raging acid storm on an alien planet. It was a scenario so fantastical, so outlandish, that it felt like a twisted dream. Yet it was his reality. Shaking off the gruesome memories, Reynolds continued his rounds, the routine providing a semblance of normalcy in the chaos. His path eventually led him to the captain's quarters. He hesitated for a moment, gathering his thoughts, before rapping on her door. Captain Patterson sat in the control room, her fingers tapping rhythmically on the armrest of her chair. The constant knocking of the ship's hull against the raging winds outside had become a sleepless lullaby. As if on cue, there was a soft knock on the door, and she called out, Come in. The door slid open, and security officer Reynolds stepped in, his face etched with concern. He removed his cap and set it on a nearby navigation console. Captain, he began, are you okay? Patterson glanced up at him, her eyes reflecting the glow of the surveillance footage that filled the dark room. She gave a weary smile and replied, the sun is coming up, whatever that means on this planet. Reynolds furrowed his brow, trying to decipher her words. Isn't that a good thing, he asked cautiously. We'll be able to communicate and possibly get some more answers from the satellite grid. Patterson's finger jumped to a gauge on the screen, indicating their rapidly depleting fuel reserves. That would be a great plan, she said, her voice tinged with sarcasm, as long as you know where to find some helium. 3. Reynolds sighed, realizing the gravity of their situation. He joined Patterson by the window, and they both stared out into the tempestuous orange haze. The storm, while starting to thin out, still raged with a relentless power. Debris flew past the ship at hundreds of miles an hour, a testament to the deadly forces of nature they were up against. Patterson's voice was laced with worry as she continued, Reynolds, we're running out of time. Without enough helium-3, we won't be able to power the communication systems or the life support for long. We need a solution, and fast. 7. After an excruciating 24 hours of enduring the relentless storm, the crew of the Calypso had been pushed to their limits. Sleep-deprived and weary, they moved through the spaceship like silent phantoms, their thoughts consumed by the unfolding crisis. The ship's interior was filled with the weight of uncertainty, a place of minds in contemplation. The only good news is no casualties in 24 hours. In the midst of this tense silence, Captain Patterson's voice echoed through the ship's intercom, breaking the stillness. All right, everyone, she began, her words carrying a solemn gravity, our radar shows that the worst of the storm has passed, and we just have to deal with smaller winds. But if you haven't noticed already, the air in here is becoming thin, and it's getting harder to breathe. The crew exchanged worried glances, their anxiety mounting as they anticipated her next words. Patterson continued, her voice solid, the reason for this is that we were supposed to get a fuel top off once we delivered our cargo. It's clear that we won't receive that now. We're running out of breathable air, and the ship will be uninhabitable in the next two hours. A heavy silence settled over the crew as the weight of the situation sank in. Abandoning the Calypso, their trusted vessel, was not a decision to be taken lightly. The ship had been their home and their lifeline in the harshness of space, and now it was failing them. Patterson's voice held a hint of sadness as she continued, our only choice is to abandon the Calypso and take refuge in Alpha Base. It won't be an easy journey, and we'll have to rely on our training and each other to survive. We faced challenges before, and we'll face this one together. The crew members nodded in solemn agreement, their expressions determined despite the fear that gripped their bones. They had trained for emergencies but nothing could have prepared them for this desolate planet and the unforgiving storm that had left them stranded. Captain Peterson led her small team as they suited up for their perilous journey from the Calypso to Alpha Base. 
The walk, though only a mile, held the potential for countless dangers in the unpredictable environment of this alien planet. Navigator Ava Laguardia, engineer Becca Chen, security officer Reynolds, cook Pamela Jonas, and crew members Gregory, Thompson, and Alonzo were all prepared for the unknown. Outside, the once furious winds had died down to a persistent breeze that still carried the threat of danger. Sharp rock shards and electrically charged debris hung in the air, ready to puncture their suits and compromise their safety. Despite the hazardous conditions, the suits had held up remarkably well so far, providing a crucial barrier between the crew and the hostile elements of the planet. As they reached the quarter-mile mark, a sudden tremor rocked the ground beneath their feet. The team staggered, but they knew they couldn't afford to lose a moment. They doubled their efforts, pressing forward toward the entrance of Alpha Base, which now seemed tantalizingly close. With a sense of urgency, they reached the airlock of the base. The team hurriedly punched in the access code, the numbers blurring in their haste. Each member entered the base as quickly as they could, all taking cover in the relative safety of the structure. Inside the trembling Alpha Base, Thompson and Gregory stood frozen in the entrance bay, their faces pale and their breath visible in the cold, recycled air. The ground had stopped shaking, but the unease remained, lingering like a haunting melody. The rest of the crew emerged from their makeshift shelters, meeting in the middle of the entrance bay. Captain Patterson's voice cut through the tension as she began to give directions. Listen up, everyone, she began, her voice steady and resolute. Our first order of business is to look for usable supplies. We have no idea how long we'll be holed up in here, and we need to make sure we have enough resources to sustain ourselves. Thompson and Gregory nodded in agreement, grateful for the clear guidance. They knew that survival would depend on their ability to adapt to the challenges of this harsh environment. The navigation of this abandoned treacherous structure. Captain Patterson continued, Next, we need to assess how broken the tech is. We can't restore full power to the base if we don't know the extent of the damage. Reynolds, I want you to take charge of that. Chen, will assist you. Reynolds and Chen acknowledged their assignments with nods of acknowledgement. They knew that repairing the base's technology was crucial not only for their survival but also for establishing communication with the outside. Navigator Ava, you and Pamela, Captain Patterson continued, will pore over the data we have, looking for blueprints and schematics of the base. We need to understand this place inside out if we're going to make it work for us. Ava and Pam exchanged a quick glance, their fear and uncertainty mirrored in each other's eyes. With their roles defined and a sense of purpose settling over the crew, they dispersed to carry out their orders. The once silent Alpha base was now filled with the sounds of footsteps and the hum of equipment, as they began the daunting process of assessing their new refuge and planning for an uncertain future in the heart of strange fuckery. Reynolds and Chen huddled around the main CPU, their tools laid out meticulously on a nearby table. The housing around the central processing unit had been removed, exposing a labyrinth of wires and connections. It was a complex puzzle they needed to piece together to bring the base fully online. Chen guided Reynolds through the intricate process, her voice steady and instructions precise as she watched the display and her own devices for the changes. Now, Reynolds carefully removed the housing around the primary data bus, she instructed her fingers pointing to the specific area on the motherboard. Make sure to note the color of the wires you find underneath. Reynolds followed her instructions closely, his current pen in hand. He touched the tip of the pen to the nodes Chen described, noting the colors that indicated the condition of each connection. It was a delicate dance of repairs, requiring precision and patience. For wires and countless other small things Calvin had no name for were repaired or replaced. As they worked together, the crew members in the entrance bay could only watch and wait anxiously. The tension in the room was palpable, 
each passing moment filled with the uncertainty of whether Reynolds and Chen could successfully revive the base's systems. After what felt like an eternity of intricate instructions and a tangle of wires, a flicker of hope crossed Chen's face. She turned to Reynolds and said, I think we've got it. Try booting up the system now. Reynolds nodded and carefully initiated the startup sequence. Lights on the control panel began to blink to life, and the hum of the base's systems gradually filled the room. It was a tense 30 minutes, but they managed to restore functionality to Alpha Base. But there was still a discrepancy with the power output. She flipped through the logs and diagrams, finally discovering the possible cause. She pointed her finger to a square portion that was three levels below where they stood. There is something we call a conduit trap, it is fairly new tech, but essentially it works the same way as an alternator did in early 20th century cars. What's the base is powered up its cycles and perpetuates the power. Everyone, except Gregory and Thompson, had gathered in the entrance bay by the time the base was fully repaired. The two absent crew members cautiously moved through the corridors of the Alpha Base's sublevel, their heavy footsteps echoing against the cold metallic floors. As they continued their search, their comm devices crackled to life, startling them both. Captain Patterson's voice came through, and the relief in their hearts was shared. At least their personal channels were back up. Thompson couldn't help but quip, Captain, do we still have communication with the outside world? Captain Patterson's voice, as dry as ever, replied, Yeah, we managed to get all the premium channels too. Patterson inquired about their location, and they promptly informed her that they were on the second level. Her voice held a note of caution as she spoke, Good, but there's something you might have to do down there while you're there. Both Gregory and Thompson exchanged glances, curiosity peaked. What is it, Captain? Gregory asked. Patterson's voice came through, slightly more serious this time. There's a device we need you to locate on the third sublevel. It's shaped like a cybernetic Christmas tree. You can't miss it. They acknowledged her orders and continued their exploration. The fluorescent lights overhead dimmed and shuttered as they scanned the seemingly endless corridors and companionways they descended into. The silence weighed on them, and despite the absence of any evidence of the former crew, they couldn't shake the feeling of being surrounded by an unseen presence. Gregory and Thompson stood at the threshold of the third sublevel, unable to go any further. Becca Chen had managed to restore most of the facility's functions, but this particular door appeared to be malfunctioning. Gregory hailed Becca through their comms, Becca, we've got a problem here. The door won't open. Any suggestions? Becca's voice crackled back, open up your toolkit and look for the tool that looks like a beetle with a horn. Let's just call that your skeleton key for now, it's like a Swiss army knife for electronics. You need to open up the housing and disconnect the blue wire. Then, connect the spare white wire sticking out of the left side of the motherboard. There should be two you're looking for the one without the black stripe. Following her instructions, sparks flew as the wires made contact and the door slowly creaked open. However, what greeted them on the other side was beyond imagination. The putrid stench that emanated from the room hit them like a physical force. Both men gagged, but Gregory's stomach couldn't handle it, and he vomited all over the floor. Captain Patterson's voice crackled through their comms, demanding to know what the problem was. Thompson, trying to regain his composure, explained, Captain, we found the missing crew members. Or, well, parts of them. Patterson pressed for more details, and Thompson hesitated for a moment before replying, it looks like a bomb went off in the room. Captain Patterson spun up their body cam's visual feed to her wrist gauntlet. She couldn't contain a gasp, putting her fist over her mouth to stifle her own reaction as she witnessed the horrifying scene. A room filled with over thirty dismembered corpses, like a grotesque jigsaw puzzle of macabre. 
Her voice was strained as she asked the question they all dreaded, what do you think did this? Gregory, still recovering from his nausea, chimed in, no idea. There's no evidence of forceful entry on that door it was just malfunctioning. It's as if it was sealed from the inside, whatever killed them had to have been in here with them. Dr. Benjamin Gaines, who had been monitoring the situation, joined Captain Patterson, peering over her shoulder at the gruesome feed. Patterson asked the unthinkable, a request that weighed heavily on everyone's conscience, proceed with the mission. Thompson, you're up. There's nothing we can do for these people, I will inform the proper channels and these people's remains will be properly dealt with. But for now if you don't get those devices back on we might join them. Reluctantly, Thompson scanned the room, his heart heavy with dread. Amid the carnage, he spotted the Christmas tree-shaped devices they had been tasked to find. Swallowing hard, he knew what needed to be done. The only problem was doing it, his doubt was wiped away by the fear that overtook him. With a deep breath, he stepped over the lifeless remains, and hewn anatomy ready to initiate the recycle protocol on the device and continue their grim mission. An iron warble filled the air, indicating they did it. Neither of the two could get out of the room or the sub-level fast enough. Thompson practically had to carry Gregory, he was so taken back by the sight. He was mumbling incoherently to himself, Thompson slapped him across the cheek as they were walking. Get it together man, I don't know what the hell happened back there, but if we don't want our asses plastered against the wall. We really need to get to the others. As Gregory and Thompson rushed back to the entrance bay of Alpha Base, they could feel the planet quaking beneath their feet once again. This time, it was different, more violent, as if the very planet itself wanted to shake them free like a dog trying to rid itself of water. The entire crew struggled to maintain their balance, some falling to their knees and others clutching onto any surface they could find for dear life. For a terrifying three minutes, the planet convulsed and jolted, threatening to tear Alpha Base apart. The structure groaned and creaked under the immense pressure, and everyone aboard knew that the base was barely holding together. Just as the planet finally settled, the crew's collective relief was cut short by the crackling voice that came over the console. Hello, is anyone there, please? Alpha Base, respond. Captain Patterson, dusting herself off, rushed over to the console and pressed the button to engage. She identified herself, stating her name and ship license number. However, the voice on the other end cut her off. Fuck your credentials. You need to get off of Alpha Prime, and you need to do it now. Captain Patterson cocked her head sideways, momentarily taken aback by the profanity, especially when she was trying to maintain professionalism. She demanded an explanation, but the voice on the other end was insistent. Listen, the voice pleaded, I apologize, but you guys don't understand the situation you've found yourselves in. That planet is toast. Take down this frequency and access me through the personal link. Everything I'm about to tell you is extremely classified. Captain Patterson replied firmly, no, you tell me right now exactly what is happening. My crew deserves to know everything. We face this together, and I'm not leaving them in the dark. There was a brief radio silence. 8. All right I'll tell you but none of you are going to like this. Alpha Base was established as an operation to set explosives and create a quarry. Gather the natural occurring metals or anything else of value and prepare the foundations for the prison. Simple right, kill two birds with one stone, the company called it. The crew exchanged weary glances and looked to their captain. Go on. She says frustration evident in her voice. Well it wasn't as simple as what they told us, day two when we actually placed the explosives and blew the quarry. That's when the quakes began. A couple days later when we finally cleared all the material from the quarry we found a cavern. 
Out of curiosity we wanted to see where it led. We never even got a chance to find out. The best way I can explain it, my people began to get possessed. I was helpless. I had to watch from the space station as they started to kill each other and then themselves. There was a long pause in the transmission. Since then I've watched everything else go to shit on that planet. I would have contacted you sooner but my orbit wouldn't allow it. I'm about to pass over your spot in about 10 minutes. I won't be able to contact you again for another 31 hours. By then you'll all be dead. So what do you suppose we do, the captain replied. Well the fact that you haven't gotten your ass out of there by now I take it your ship is incapable. You assume correctly, she replied. I was worried that was going to be the case. I have a backup plan but I highly doubt you're going to like it. Captain Patterson slammed fist on the console. Anything's better than being stuck here on this godforsaken planet waiting to die. Another long pause. Okay, I take it you haven't gone beyond the entrance bay. In the room behind you there are two satellite tubes. Inside each one is a capsule, you will have to remove the satellites from inside and between the two of them split your weight. I don't like this, I don't like this at all. Gregory chimed in from the back. Keep it to yourself, it might be the only way off of this rock. She said before re-establishing comms. I haven't even gotten your name who am I talking to? The voice crackled in, Mission Director Anita Bosman. She wanted to say something else, but the communication was cut off when her orbit passed the communication range. As the door locks disengaged with a hiss, Sarah couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation. Too much had gone wrong on this op. As the wide metal doors lowered into the floor, revealing the cargo loading bay, Patterson did a quick headcount. Her heart sank when she realized that two members of her crew were missing, E. Calvin and Pamela Jonas. She couldn't afford any delays, and now surely wasn't the time to play hide-and-seek. We don't have time for this, she muttered to herself, then turned to her crew. Alonso, she called out, find out where Calvin and Pamela went. The rest of you, follow me. With a determined stride, Captain Patterson led the remaining crew members through the massive doors and into the storage bay. The low hum of machinery and the soft glow of emergency lights filled the cavernous space. The room was littered with metal crates and equipment, but their focus was on the capsules containing the valuable satellites. Thompson and Gregory quickly got to work on one of the capsules, unscrewing bolts and accessing the control panel next to it. Becca Chen and Dr. Gaines tackled the other capsule, disconnecting the wires and connectors, the capsules were a marvel of engineering, their surfaces adorned with intricate patterns of rivets and access panels. Each one was about the size of a small car, and the satellites inside were crucial for a future prison project. Two hours passed in a whirlwind of focused work. Bolts clinked as they were removed, and panels were opened with a hiss of escaping air. The crew meticulously extracted the satellites from their protective capsules, handling them with care. But as time ticked on, there was growing concern about Alonso's absence. Captain Patterson couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. She exchanged worried glances with her crew, their eyes reflecting uncertainty. 9. Alonso descended into the second sublevel. The power being fully restored had banished the shadows, but it did little to dispel the eerie feeling that twisted about in the air. He could hear faint whispers here and there he would try to ignore. But the further he progressed they rose in volume. There was an unsettling absence of any signs of Calvin and Pamela, and part of him almost hoped he wouldn't find any signs at all, knowing that it would likely mean something terrible had happened. As he reached the end of the first corridor, he hesitated, his gaze fixed on the companionway leading to the dreaded third sublevel. He recalled the horrifying images he'd seen on the feed when Thompson and Gregory had ventured there. 
the memory had a smell, a smell like copper, and he had no desire to witness such carnage with his own eyes. Or smell that copper scent he knew would accompany the image. A dense feeling of dread fell upon him, he decided against descending further and turned to retrace his steps. But just as he began to walk away, a voice cut through the silence, calling his name. Alonso, he turned to see Pamela, naked and standing at the bottom of the stairs. Her beckoning gesture was hypnotic, and Alonso felt as though he had no control over his own anatomy. It was as if her call was summoning him to the third sub-level. He found himself descending the stairs, step by step, each heartbeat intensifying the ominous feeling in his chest. He felt like the space behind his ribs was lined with lead and filled with nightmares. And then he saw it at the end of the corridor, a Calvin, also naked but bearing gruesome alterations. Calvin had removed his own genitals, and intricate alien symbols were carved onto his flesh by means he dare not guess. Alonso's mind screamed in horror, but his mouth followed no such command. Only he could hear his screams, as his body and mind all at once were torn asunder. Captain Patterson had spent most of her life in command, a position of authority that had brought with it a certain sense of superiority and control. She had faced countless challenges and navigated her crew through the treacherous void of space, always with a calm and confident demeanor. But now, as she stood in the control room of the spacecraft, all of those illusions were shattered by a sound that seemed to drown the world out with it. It was a sound she had heard only once before in her life, a sound that haunted her nightmares. Three flat lines, their tones oscillating in and out of phase with each other the unmistakable signal of death. She looked down and saw the flat lines on her display of Pamela Jonas, Alonso Caputo, and Calvin Reynolds. Her heart sank, and for a moment, she felt utterly powerless. Dr. Benjamin Gaines, Engineer Becker Chen, Thompson, and Gregory all looked up from their work, absolutely speechless. But it was Ava, who found her voice first. They're dead, she said, her words cutting through the heavy silence that had fallen over the bay. As soon as the words left Ava's lips, the once smiling, witty, and smart navigator's face turned ashen. Captain Patterson felt a profound sadness wash over her. These were not just her crew members, they were her family, her responsibility. She had failed to protect them. She strongly regretted sending Alonso alone, they all should have gone. Captain Patterson knew they couldn't dwell on this loss for long. They were still in the midst of a FUBAR situation, one that held fate in its hands. With a heavy heart, she gave her crew a small moment of silence to mourn the departed. Then, in a voice filled with self-doubt, she addressed them. We need to hurry, she said, her words dying in the air. We can't let their sacrifice be in vain. With their supplies hastily stowed away and anything remotely resembling comfort crammed into the capsules, the crew was divided. Captain Patterson, Dr. Gaines, and Ava Lagerda squeezed into one capsule, while Gregory and Thompson found themselves in the other. The new arrangement was far from ideal, launching now would only hurl them aimlessly into the void of space. They had no choice but to wait for Alita to pass by once more. What followed was a harrowing day-long wait that would scar their souls forever. The unrelenting darkness of Alpha Base pressed against the capsule's windows, while the clock inched forward at an agonizing pace. Each second felt like an eternity. As the hours dragged on, the capsule's occupants were subjected to a nightmarish torment. Apparitions of their fallen crew members, mangled and mutilated, materialized before their eyes. These grotesque spectres seemed to defy the laws of reality, their forms contorted in unnatural ways as they whispered chilling promises of release from their metal prison. Captain Patterson, once a figure of authority, was rendered powerless in the face of this malevolent onslaught. She cowered, her leadership reduced to a hollow shell of what it once was. It was Ava who emerged as their guiding voice in the terror. 
she did her best to calm her fellow crew members. While this unknown entity tried its best to instigate fear, fury and insanity. After a three-hour symphony of indescribable gore and grotesque representations of their friends. The whispers, screams, threats and promises died down. The fear-driven adrenaline that pumps through their veins quickly exhausted the crew. One by one a Britly held sleep claimed them. A few hours later it was the knocking that woke Sarah, the captain looked up. Her groggy eyes struggled to focus on the now flickering cargo bay. At first there was nothing, then the rhythmic clank and hiss of the entrance hatch opening woke everyone from their slumber. A thick cloud of the acidic haze from Alpha Prime's atmosphere bellowed into the entrance bay. Everyone watched in horror as amongst the mist. The hissing and popping remains of Henry walked into the entrance bay. Both capsule's occupants leaned forward for a better view, watching the monstrosity in their friend's skin approach. It placed a still melting skeletal hand against the cryoglass. The creature turned its attention to the console. Fuck me, that's not good. Gregory said, but Thompson thought. What are we gonna do? Ava shook the captain, she was mumbling under her breath. Clearly in shock from the living nightmare. She then looked to Becca Chen who was sweating profusely while fidgeting with her wrist gauntlet, typing in long lines of code. All right, we don't have a choice. I hope this works. She entered one final command on her wrist gauntlet, and then a snapping noise occurred. Everyone looked troubled at each other, and before they could even muster a thought. Spiraling metal doors in the roof open, and they were hurled into the acidic atmospheres barreling towards space. Even inside of the capsule, they could hear the ear-piercing scream that left the planet's surface in their wake. The rumbling of their escape pods was matched by the quaking planet below. Becca Chen, her fingers trembling, input the command into her wrist gauntlet. Her eyes darted to the control panel, where a myriad of blinking lights and chaotic readouts filled the screen. With a deep breath, she activated the upward thrusters, their engines roaring to life. The capsules jolted, their ascent slowing to a crawl. One more small thrust and their ascent was hardly perceptible. In the distance cresting over the horizon, they saw the space station. For the first time in days, they felt a jolt of hope. Chen held her breath as she hailed it. They all nearly turned blue before a voice came back in response. My goodness, is that you? Alita's voice asked over comms, yes please, can you retrieve us? Becca waited for a response. There was no need, they felt the magnetic tug of the polarity beam that caught their capsules in its influence. A strange sensation of begging weight down by extreme G-forces rendered the weary crew immobilized. A loud thump. A click. And finally, the feeling released them, and they all took deep, gasping breaths. A synthetic, pre-recorded voice came over the comms. Pressure stabilization protocol underway. A few seconds later the hatches will spun, once clockwise stopping to click and expand into a wider ring. Another spin counterclockwise and the hatch unsealed. The other end of the threshold was dark and smelled of mold. Both capsules occupants stepped out side by side in the companion way. The dark interior wasn't as inviting as they hoped, then a sound. A loud chirping alarm went off and they all spun to watch the red light above the two docking ports blink. Once, twice, and on the third time was the distinct sound of the capsules snapping loose to fall to Alpha Prime. Another alarm sounded, this one was drowned out by the silence of space. The screams were silent, sound doesn't travel in the vacuum of space. Their tears froze on their eyeballs and their insides were filled with the chill of absolute zero. But unlike the rumors, no one dies quickly in space. They suffocated on their own blood as their lungs collapsed in their chest. Due to the rapid decompression. 
their eardrums blew and snapped shut with a loud pop before nothing could be heard. Then the onset of extreme hypothermia. In the end, it took them almost two minutes to die. But even then, as life transformed into the afterlife, the bright light that started as a small point in their vision had expanded until it took their entire field of view, before narrowing and becoming black once more. Then they each experienced the sensation of falling extremely fast. Colors began to take shape, until a world of unrecognizable shapes that whispered shared delights of pain looked up at them with serrated surfaces. Undulating tentacles of biomechanical filth sifted between the waves. Great skeletal serpents made of pure alloy travel between moving portals. They fell into the hell of another type of evil. There were no words for the tortures and unknown hells that would come to pass in that wretched place. And we should all be thankful there isn't.